don't talk bad about anyone too because ten island is small. So ah, oh, she's my age. Yes. Um. Yeah. So yes, ten island is very small. So you never know. And so even like in class, I'm always careful about who the scenarios I give about like actual active cases because. I don't know who you know. Maybe you have a case in my court. I have no idea. So, I, you know, I got to keep it good. Okay. So I'm going to start recording now. And we're going to today talk about this. Today's just the intro in criminal law. So you are in what? Business law. So we're obviously going to talk about the law. Give me in plain words in your own, you know, plain English, what is the law? What does the law mean to you? It's like a set of rules. Yep, set of rules. And what's the purpose of these rules? To prevent chaos. To prevent chaos. Very good. Very good. Yes, it is a set of rules and they're aimed at preventing chaos. They're aimed at keeping the community uh, at peace. And it's supposed to kind of be fair, fair treatment amongst all people, right? So if you break this rule, you're going to get this kind of punishment. Is there anything else that you want to say about the law? Uh, who, who, go ahead. They're usually meant to be ethical. Usually meant to be ethical. We're actually, yeah. it's actually, um, you're, you're making the segue to my next point. And since you brought it up, I'm actually going to ask, what is the difference? No, strike that. Are laws moral? They should be. Uh, some law, it really depends on the country. Depends on the country. Let's stick with the U.S. for now. The laws that we have here, are they moral? Some of it. Some of it. Not necessarily. Does a law need to be moral? No. 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 Right? Because as somebody pointed out, it's objective. My sense of morality could be very different than your sense of morality. So when we also talk about the law, we talk about different um, we talk about different rules and regulations. And I also want to point out that with law, some of them are statutory, meaning that they are written down. They're black and white. They kind of say, here's, you know, do not murder. Do not, you know, like if you murder this person, you're going to get this X amount of years. But there's also laws that are made by precedence, meaning a certain situation or a fact pattern is going to happen and the court will rule on it. And then other courts will also rule on it to kind of keep things consistent. So that's two ways to um, have um, rules and law set up. But we're gonna go back to morality and the law. I'm going to give you a fact pattern and that's something I do throughout the semester. We look at fact patterns. So, and again, Ali, this might this might ring a bell. So you don't speak because you were in my class before. If you have been in my class before, you know, don't answer. Let the let the new people. Um, let me see where they stand. So let's say we're actually in a live classroom, and uh, one of you is having a allergic reaction to peanuts, and I have a EpiPen, and with that EpiPen, I could save your life. So I, we have 40, let's say we have 50 students in the classroom. There's a person now who can't breathe. Okay, their breathing is, is, is um, their throat's swelling up. And I say to everyone, I announce to the entire class, I have the EpiPen and I run over to the student and I'm about to stab them in the thigh. That way I can save their life. But right before, my EpiPen breaks their skin, the pants. I move my hand back and I say, you know what? EpiPens are really expensive now. And like, what if my kid has an allergic reaction? What if I need it for them? And I decide not to inject you. Is what I did Two, it's going to be two two questions. Is what I did moral? But wouldn't that go back to what you said? If how some other people might think something like different people have different morals, basically. Right. So just a show of hands, give me a yes or a no. Is what I did, according to you, is it moral? If you think it, what I did was moral, raise your hand. No, it's not. One person said yes. 
Okay. Now, is what I did, listen to this, is what I did illegal? Illegal. Did I break any laws? No. It's just kind of not a great thing to do. Right. So I did something maybe selfish. It wasn't moral. So when we talk about morality and the law, they may not go hand in hand. Now, yes, I know there's a lot of people that are putting in the chat. There's like 82 messages right now. So if it's important, you need to kind of like raise your hand because I cannot keep up with the things you guys are writing. Uh, it's like blowing up right now. I'm going to give you the same fact pattern, but I'm going to change it slightly. Having allergic reaction, I take out my EpiPen. I'm about to stab you, save your life. I'm about to stab you. And at that time, half of the class leaves because they can't stomach this. They don't want to see what happens. It's making them, they're very sensitive. They don't want to watch. They're, 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 you know, they're, throw, they're about to throw up. They don't want to witness somebody dying, blah, 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 you know. And after half the class leaves, I then say out loud, I'm not going to go through with this because again, I want to preserve my EpiPen. They're all 18 years and older. They should have had their own EpiPen if they know that they're allergic to peanuts. Why aren't they carrying it? So the question I'm going to ask now is, in this scenario, did I do anything illegal? Is there gonna, am I gonna have any legal ramifications? All the things that are popping up are saying no. Am I gonna have any legal ramifications? Actually, I can. There may be legal ramifications against me. And I'll tell you why, unless somebody wants to take a stab at why there would be legal ramifications against me. I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? I'm saying there would be, there could be legal ramifications against me in the second fact pattern. Why? It's, I still decided not to go through with saving this person's life. They're still above the age of 18 and I was going to do it. I decided not to do it. So why is it different in the second fact pattern as opposed to the first? Anyone? Uh, maybe because now you're doing it for the sake of vanity? No. Okay. Yeah. Could it be because the class left in there and before they left you were intending to save them and that's the last information they know exactly you're actually very you're you're right those people that left are now under the assumption that i'm taking the action of saving this person's life so they're not going to do anything to try to seek help they i've taken an affirmative step forward and i've prevented others from getting help now, I had people in the classroom who could have also gotten help, but that's why I said it, I may be under legal ramifications because those people that left were under the assumption I was going to save this life. So I prevented them from seeking help. And so when we talk about the law and in this class, sometimes one tiny fact can change the outcome of a case. And so with the law, you must always ask questions. You get as much information as possible. Why? Because that specific fact, that one tiny fact can actually be the difference between why somebody goes to jail and why somebody stays out of jail. Okay. So always ask those things. So when you're reading cases, and the reason I love cases is because I feel like they demonstrate what the law is all about. And so throughout the semester, especially in the first third and the second third, we talk a lot about cases and different cases because cases are kind of like stories. They tell you and they explain to you what the law is trying to say, but now it's like the application of the law. Okay, we're good. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, so far, I haven't told you anything that you need to write down. This has all been, um, you know, listening stuff. When we talk about classification of the law, this is also listening. It is, you know, there's differences between public and private law. Private law is essentially when there's 
contracts between people. Uh, the bigger distinction between the classification of law, which we're going to talk about today, is the criminal sense and the civil sense. What happens when there is a criminal action? When we have a criminal case, what's the outcome of that case? There's a lot of outcomes, not just one. Sorry. All right, somebody go. You both started and you both stopped. Uh, ideally, that person gets convicted, the one that committed the crime. And what happens when they get convicted? Where do they end up? Prison. Prison. So in a criminal case, if somebody is found guilty, they end up going to a prison. What happens in a civil case if somebody's found um, liable? What happens? Uh, they got to pay the money that they're yeah. asking for. Yeah. So when we talk about civil cases, we're talking about mostly 90%, right? Mostly in civil cases, the outcome is something monetary. Whereas when we talk about criminal cases, the outcome is the loss of liberty. OK, losing somebody's freedom. So when we also talk about the um, criminal law and the civil law, we also talk about burden of proof. And this is something you need to write down. So ready? This is a write it down moment. This is the burden of proof. This is the burden of proof in criminal law versus civil law. And you when I say it, this is going to ring a bell. In criminal law. The burden of proof is beyond all reasonable doubt. You've heard that before, right? Beyond all reasonable doubt. If you've ever watched a uh, the, the law shows, Law and Order SVU, you, you've heard that all the time, right? So in a criminal case, we talk about the burden of proof being beyond all reasonable doubt. When we talk about a civil case, it's by preponderance of the evidence. So in a civil case, it's by preponderance of the evidence. Preponderance of the evidence. What does that actually mean? So let's go back to criminal. In a criminal case for a district attorney to prove his or her case, they must prove all the elements of a crime beyond all reasonable doubt. I like to have you visualize that. If you were to put it on a number line, the burden of proof beyond all reasonable doubt on a scale of one to 100, what do you think that number would be beyond all reasonable doubt? How much do you have to prove on a scale of one to 100 that what you're saying is correct in order for you to prove beyond all reasonable doubt? Between one to 100, give me a number. 100? Nope, too much. Uh, 60%? More than 60, less than 100. 85? 85%? Cool. More than 85? 60. 95. It's about 90 to 95%. Because we're, we're saying that beyond all reasonable doubt that this person is guilty has committed the crime. So it's not all crazy doubts, right? It's all reasonable doubt. So what's reasonable doubt? You can always bring doubt in a case. You can always bring a different, you know, like uh, if somebody's um, accused of killing another individual and it happened at nighttime, you can say that maybe they didn't see them, that it was dark, that they didn't get a good look, you know, so you can have doubt. But all reasonable doubt is beyond circumstantial evidence. It is more likely than not by a lot that this person in fact is guilty. When we also talk about, when I use the word elements, that's an important concept for you to know throughout the semester. When I talk about the elements of a crime or the elements of a specific concept of the law, it's basically like when you break that down. And you're going to see that by the end of the lecture today, what I, what I really mean by that. When we talk about, you know, murder, let's say, it's not like somebody just killed another person and that, all right, they're going to go to jail or gonna, they're going to go to prison. There's actually specific layers in the law, specific things that must be met, that a district attorney must prove beyond all reasonable doubt. Every element must be proven in order for somebody to be convicted of guilt, whether it's assault, whether it's murder or whatever it is, uh, larceny, um, forgery, the, everything has a, a, an element to it, elements, and those all have to be proven. So, so that's that. 
Now, when we talk about a civil case and preponderance of the evidence, what do you think on a number scale preponderance of the evidence means? So, you know, by, beyond all reasonable doubt is like a 90, 95. What about preponderance of the evidence in a civil case where the outcome is monetary? It's a guess from one to 100. 100? Nope. Okay. Less. You said 50, Jessica, but you're, you're close. It's not 50. It's a little bit more. 55? 51. It's actually 51. And I'll tell you why. You can even say it's 50.1 because you must show that it's more likely than not. So if you had a scale, it's got to just tip slightly. So if you've ever watched Judge Judy, if you ever watched those shows, right? They just have to show that their side is more likely than not to be correct. It's not beyond all reasonable doubt. You don't have to go above and beyond. Why? Because when you're suing somebody for money, money's not as important as the loss of liberty. So preponderance of the evidence is used in all civil cases. And when we talk about a criminal, it's beyond all reasonable doubt. If we were in law school, I would tell you about a whole other different set. Um, who's Judge Judy going crazy? Who is Jack Collins? And I see a lot of things popping up from you. Uh, okay, no. If, if, if we talk about cases that have to do with constitutional law or also different types of law, we could also be talking about clear and convincing evidence and other levels and other standards. But for purposes of this 160 level class, it's only going to be uh, beyond all reasonable doubt and, be, and the um, uh, preponderance of the evidence. I always test on that, always, the different standards. So that's something that you need to know. So what would be, uh, sorry to interrupt. No. Go ahead. On an exam, like, what would be the question? Like, how would you, like, form the question? Like, I guess you'll have to wait and see. But it's going to be about the criminal. You know, it could be as simple as what's the burden of proof in a criminal case. It could be as simple as that, but it might not be. So and you that just that need would to. Be, that would be beyond all reasonable doubt. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then for the civil case, it's by preponderance of the evidence. Yes. Okay. And know the numbers. Understand the concepts. Because a lot of times... You the know, numbers, when I, like when you ask, uh, sorry to cut you off. That's okay. Uh, the numbers, like when you say numbers, you mean like uh, when you ask like out of a hundred. Yep. Like that. Yeah. yeah. That because really yeah, you, you need to understand the concepts because I'm not, I'm not always asking for straight up definitions. I'm giving you scenarios and then I'm asking you to apply what you've learned. We have to be the detective. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So it's not like you're not some questions. You're not going to just like look in your textbook and get the answer because the questions I make up, they're from my brain. So it's important that you understand it. Yeah. So the if numbers again, the numbers. Uh... Sure. Sure. So the numbers are in a in a criminal case where it's beyond all reasonable doubt. It's a 90 to 95 percent. And in a preponderance of the evidence in a civil case, it's 51. Let's stick with 51. Okay. And then you said something about uh, element. Yes. I didn't really Hold say. that thought when I, there's a definition I'm going to give you and you're going to see, cause I'm going to put it in the chat and it'll make sense that way. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, also, this is something that I want you to know, and this is a, a write it down moment. Uh, the judicial system is an adversarial system. So the judicial system, the justice system is adversarial. So what does that mean? It means that somebody's got to initiate the problem in the court. The courts don't know. They're not going to, you know, like, there's no way for the courts to know who wronged who, right? Somebody has to bring an action. So if you have a lawsuit problem, somebody hit you, somebody rear-ended you, and you're going to sue them, you have to bring that action in the court. It's an adversarial you're not all going to go hunky-dory and figure it out yourselves. You could, but a lot of times it's an adversarial. You must bring the action to the court in order for you to have a resolution of some sort. Okay? All right. When we talk about also criminal, we're going to now, for today's lectures, it's, it's going to be heavy on criminal. 
when we talk about criminal, you know, in this country, unlike a lot of other countries, you are presumed innocent until you're proven guilty. Okay, so here there's also a presumption of innocence. And so that's why when we talk about the um, the elements of crime, it's on that it's on the district attorney to prove those elements in order to put you behind bars. And today we're also going to talk about the fourth, fifth and sixth amendment and the right to counsel and the right not to go and testify against yourself pleading the fifth. So we're going to talk about that also today, just a little bit later. Um, when we also talk about crimes, we talk about punishment, right? So we already discussed and said that a punishment of a crime could be imprisonment. What other ways can there be punishment for a crime or an incident? Uh, probation. Probation, correct. Mm -hmm. What else? Fines. Fines, that's right. You can fine people. There's also the death penalty in some states, right? So if there is somebody that has committed a crime, the penalty could be fines, it could be imprisonment, it could be probation, it could be one of those things. What if it was a company or a corporation that committed a crime? Fines usually. Usually fines. And then the people that are really were negligent or they really committed the crimes, those people would be imprisoned. But yeah, you got it. When we talk about, um, again, a crime, there are, and we talk about elements. So in a crime, every crime has to have these two components in it. And then, so like think of a crime and this is the umbrella. In a crime, there must be two elements, two parts to it. It's called the mens rea, M-E-N-S, rea, mens rea, and the actus rea. I always test on that. So this is also a write it down moment. So in a crime, in a criminal action, there must be these two overarching elements, mens rea and actus rea. What does that mean in plain English? That was the Latin. What does mens rea mean? Um, I think it's your state of mind at the time of the crime. Excellent, excellent. It is your, the mental component, the mental component of the crime itself. You were thinking about it. You wanted to commit that crime. Uh, what? Yes. Sorry, uh, just how do you spell Rhea again? R-E-A. R-E-A, okay, thank you. You're welcome. And the actus, actus Rhea is what? Actus Reyes. What is the actus Reyes? The actions that you took? Exactly. It's the action itself, right? So it's the mental component plus the action that equal a mental or a crime itself. So I'm going to now give you some examples. I got into a fight with my husband and I just keep thinking about how I'm going to get him back. I'm going to kill him. I've had it. He's making my life miserable. I usually talk about my mother-in-law, but my husband's right outside. So I don't want to make it too real. You know, I don't want him to hear that. So I'm thinking about the, um, the, the, how I'm going to get him. I, I got to get him. So I think about all these different ways where I'm going to torture and kill him because he's just making my life miserable. I could think about it all I want. I didn't commit a crime because it's only one component. I didn't act upon it, right? The flip side is, have you heard of the term heat of passion crime, right? The heat of passion is the most common scenario is one person walks on another, their spouse or their significant other, they see them in bed with another person, they lose it, they go get a knife or they have a gun with them and they shoot that person. They didn't think about it. It was just the action itself. They get a, there's usually a lesser degree of punishment than actual murder because murder, if that's the example we're talking about, it has to have the mental component and the action itself. So now I'm going to give you a question based on what I said. If you were going to, let's say you wanted to commit a crime. Yes, methodically laid out. If you wanted to commit a crime and you start Googling, somebody give me a crime because I don't want it to all be out of my head. But keep in mind, you're also being recorded. So if you're going to give me a crime example, don't actually commit it in real life because this can't be used against you. Robbery. Robbery. Let's go with robbery. And do you have a particular person, David, that you want to rob? Don't answer that. Don't answer that, David. Don't answer that. Let's pretend that David does. He wants to rob his neighbor. 
all right? And his neighbor lives in a big house and David has been eyeing that house. David starts to Google how to rob a house. David orders on Amazon the material he needs to rob a house. David goes and starts to take steps to rob the house. Is David going to get in trouble? He hasn't robbed the house yet. Is he going to get in trouble? Yes. No. I want you to defend your answer. So if you're going to say it, I want you to now give me the reason why. Uh, no, because he really didn't do it yet. He didn't yeah. do it. There's okay. No, no crime yeah, yet. but also there's motive. Like even like for myself, there's motive. You know what there's I mean? Motive, but you still, you didn't, you buying but, stuff online doesn't equal he robbed a bank. Those two are not. Have you heard of attempted? Attempted exactly. murder, exactly. attempted yeah. robbery, attempted burglary. I was going to do assault. it, but I got caught right. before I did it. Yeah. If he tries to rob his neighbor and his neighbor shoots him, that's attempting to rob him. But if, if, if he doesn't go to his neighbor's house at all and he just orders shit online, that's not that's not actually a crime. It actually yeah. could be because it's going to depend on whether or how far I went. That's right. How far you went. The substantial steps. Have you taken substantial steps to commit your crime and your efforts were thwarted by an intervening act? So number one lesson, don't Google stuff. Don't commit crimes. That actually should be number one. So don't commit a crime. Don't plan on it. Don't do it. Don't order things on Amazon so you can commit it. Hold on. My children find me. One second. All right. Um, they found me, so I had to relocate again. So when we talk about crimes, it's about that effort. So again, um, for your purposes of uh, components and elements, it's got to be the mens rea, the actus rea, the mental component and the actual action taking place for you to have a full-fledged crime. Somebody I saw pop up about conspiracy. Conspiracy is it's two people or more wanting to commit a crime. Otherwise, if it's just you wanting to do the burglary, robbery, assault, murder, whatever it is, and you get, those efforts get thwarted, it's attempted, okay? And there's different degrees and it depends on the state that you go to. So different states have different laws and different, um, all that stuff. So that is the mental component and the actual action. Um, Okay, when we also talk about criminal, actually, you know what, before I get into that, I want to take attendance before I forget, because then I'll, I'll you guys will all sign off. So um, when I say your name, please say it. Don't give me anything on the chat, because I'm not looking at it. I'm on a different screen. So just say here, okay? Um, Nagy Abdul Yemen. Yemen. Uh, here, uh, Naji. Naji, okay. Uh, Michael Alamo. Here. Eon Michael Alarcon. Here. Cheryl Aline. Here. Tyler Aponte. Here. Ali, I saw you. Uh, David Megdi Besteros. Besteros. Here. Okay. Paul Bilali. Here. Eldon Capri. Here. Michael Cardinito. Cardinito. Here. Haley Lynn Caruso. Here. Deborah Salona. Here. Kian Wen Chen. Here. Ayeb Sisi. I'm here. Ian Lorenzo Colon. Here. Francine Camito. Francine, yeah, hi. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Here, hi. Hi. Uh, Joseph Krupe. Here. That name also sounds familiar. Joseph Krupe. Stand on small. Or were you in my class before? No, I wasn't in the uh, prior class. All right. Uh, Carmine Daydon. Daydoni. Here. Present. Thank you. Uh, John Davis. Here. 
Jun G. Du. I'm here. Okay, great. Rachel du Dunias. Here. Talia Dunias. Here. Are you like siblings? Yeah, we're sisters. Oh, that's so <laughs> yeah. fun. Okay. She's don't cheat. You too. Don't cheat. We won't. We won't. Don't worry. I'm so, right. I'll teach her. Okay, thank you. Um, Cesar Escamilla. Caesar. Okay. Angelica Finocchiara. Here. Deidre Jamenda Foster. Here. Gia Gianna Marie Galina. Here. Amanda Isabel Gartzebin. Here. Sayed Gilani. Sayed Jelani. David Gronach. Here. Ezra Gorsoy. Here. Dia Eldin Jabrell. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hasher Khalid. Here. Victoria Lasade. I thought I heard a faint yeah here. Victoria? Liana Mosserino. Here. Bridget O'Brien. Here. Brandon Ortega. Here. Christopher Parinello. Here. Vincent Patty. Uh, Q Ling Q. Here. Jessica Rivera. I'm here. Andrew Shinuda. Here. Nicholas Stoll. Here. Mm, Michelle Tu. Michelle or Michael Tu. M I C H E L L E. Runha Wang. Julia Wijensing. I'm here. Okay, great. Shen Quan Wu. I'm here. Great. Jia Long Zhang. I'm here. Great. Okay, it's a lot of kids, a lot of students here. Is there anybody that I did not call? Okay, great. So we're going to continue on with our criminal law. Um, okay. Next thing I want you to know, and this is a write it down moment, is the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor. What do you think of the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor is? Uh, felony is federal law. Felony is federal law? That's best guess. No, okay. Next. The severity of the crime. Severity of the crime. So a misdemeanor is considered a minor crime. Punishment by jail, which is less than a year. A felony is punishment usually one year or more. So a felony, one year or more. A misdemeanor, less than one year. A uh, misdemeanor is jail. Felony is prison. If you're going to prison, it means you're going to do more than one year. If you're going to jail, it's usually less than a year. That's something you need to know, FYI. Okay. So the next thing, um, we kind of touched upon the punishment of a corporation. So there, there's all different types of crimes, right? And your textbook talks about larceny. It talks about embezzlement, false pretenses, robbery, burglary, all that stuff. Remember when I was talking to you about elements, I want you to go look at the chat. I'm about to put this in because this is really the best way for me to explain elements. So larceny, larceny, the actual definition of larceny is the trespassory 
taking and carrying away of or exercising dominion or control over personal property of another with the intent of depriving the victim permanently of those goods. You see those, yeah, that's why I wrote it down in the chat. You see those numbers that I have written next to certain words? You see number one, trespassory. Uh, number I don't see anything in the chat. Oh, I forgot to send it. Hold on. Press the press. There we go. Better? Okay, sorry about that, guys. I'm not technologically, you know, that good. So you see now, now that it makes sense, larceny, trespassory, taking, carrying away, exercising, all that stuff. You see the numbers? Those are the elements of the crime. The crime is actually broken down into very, it's in, in lesser degrees, right? It's the definition of larceny. And so when a district attorney has to bring this case to a court, they must bring and, and bring and prove every one of those elements beyond all reasonable doubt. So they break down the crime into its, you know, simplest kind of terms as the law dictates. And then each one of those has to be proven beyond all reasonable doubt. So let's say we were actually in the classroom and somebody was walking past like the hallway, they run in, they steal my bag and they run out. Five minutes later, they come back and give me my bag. Did they commit larceny? They trespassed, right? They came into my classroom, they took away, they carried away, my personal property, because that's not theirs, but did they intend to deprive me of them permanently? Uh, yeah. No. They gave it back. They gave it back, right? So that sixth element was not there. So they might have committed another crime, but they didn't commit larceny because all six elements were not there. So basically, Professor, uh, I don't mean to cut you off. No. Basically, in order for them to complete, uh, to I mean, in order for them to commit larceny, uh, they have to complete all six of the all six things that you have. Right, but it's you don't usually look at it from the side of the um, the person committing the crime. I want you to look at it from the district attorney that has to prove it. So the district attorney's office has to prove that this person who now they're charging with larceny committed all those things. But they committed part of it. They see that's the thing. Right. They committed part of it. So technically they committed a crime. But if we're going to go by ignoring that last step because they didn't do it. Right. It wouldn't be saying, larceny. It okay, might be yeah, exactly. something. It question. might be trespassing. Right. So oh, trespassing yeah. is going to somebody else's property without their permission. So uh, they trespassed. And yeah. that's why in criminal law, you often have and actually, I don't know if you know this. So I'm going to tell you. So in criminal law, there's usually like the highest um, charge. But there's always all these other charges. So let's say the DA can't prove the, 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 the highest level charge, the one with the most punishment. There's always these other little ones because they can prove trespassing. They could prove perhaps maybe uh, maybe it's not larceny per se. Maybe it's petty larceny or assault or something like that where the definition of assault or maybe petty larceny is a portion of that larceny definition I gave you. So they can prove that, but not the actual larceny. Uh -huh. okay, so, so it's kind of like that. Uh, so what was I going to say? Um... So let me also, while you're thinking, let me also say this. That's why also in criminal law, and this is like a your for your own information, when a DA brings a charge and they bring all those other charges, that's why a lot of times settlements happen. They plea out. Right. Because they say, hey, listen, if we're going to charge you with A, B, C and D, you're going to get and you're found guilty, you're going to get 20 years in prison. But if you just plea to doing one and two, you only get five years. And so they're pleading to lesser charges and so they can get less time in prison or they can take their chances in court. Now, don't forget, in court, the DA has to prove what every single element beyond all reasonable doubt. Okay, David, did you think of your question? No, no, sorry, you can, right. you can. I can continue, thank you, I appreciate it. So that is um, the elements, okay? So that's, those are the elements. So every crime has its elements. And a lot of times criminal law is statutory, which means it's actually written down. If you look at the criminal penal code of the state of New York, it breaks down what 
the, you know, what the definitions, if you will, definitions of crimes are, the different degrees. And so that's why like an ADA will kind of look at and say, you know, I can, you know, based on the circumstances of this occurrence, I could bring maybe this charge, but I could also bring this charge and that charge. Okay. So that's, that's criminal law. Um, and those are the elements. Now we talked about crimes, right? And the elements and what you have to prove, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a fact pattern. Okay. And I want you to put your attorney hats on, lawyerly hats. So, um, I need, I need a volunteer to, to come up with a crime. David had the burglary, but give me something else. Tax fraud. Huh? Tax fraud. No, no. Give me something a little juicier. Give me. Vandalism. Like a van guys, murder. Give me talk. Like, you know, <laughs> terrorism. Huh? Terrorism. All right. Forget it. No, like, cause terrorism, there's then consensual federal charges. Murder? Yeah. You say consensual? The capital and yeah. Consensual murder. How do you have consensual but murder? Someone's like, can you murder me? And you murder them. <laughs> I've not, I mean, that's like, you know, like the, you know, angel of mercy kind of thing. I think that's called assisted suicide. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. You know, I'm going to just give you an example. because What about kidnapping or arson? Okay, we can do kidnapping. Kidnapping is fun. Okay. So let's say, here's the fact pattern. Um... I have sole custody of my children and I live in New York. Their father, who I'm divorced from and have an order of protection from, comes, picks up the kids from school. It's not fun. I, it's fun for this example. Thank you. Um, they come pick up the kids from school and they are they, they take them across state lines. It is the father. If you were representing the father, what would your argument be as to why that was done? Uh, the mother is abusive. Good. Mother is abusive. What else? Well, do you have the order of protection, of protection or do the kids do? I do. Okay. But I like where you're going with it. And you have full custody in this? In this I have full custody, but he's got visitation rights. He, so is he allowed to pick them up from school? I'm going to leave that as not clear. So that could be well, one that would be other, but that's a good question. Okay. I might argue that he thought it was his visitation time. Okay. What else? Yeah, Family yeah. emergency. Yes. Family emergency. So you see how you have to, I think Bridget, you did it really well. You have to ask questions so you can get more information as to the fact pattern. So then you can develop your defenses. So a good attorney especially criminal attorneys, right? Their job is to defend people that are being charged with crimes. So how do you do that? You need to ask and inquire, look what the law says, and then kind of protect your client as much as possible. You're, you know, sometimes I think criminal attorneys have a bad rap that they're like letting criminals go. But, you know, were rules followed? Is there a justification? So whenever we talk about the law throughout the semester, we talk about, defenses okay and some of the defenses would be you know it could be that there was duress there was mistake of fact it could be that somebody made him do it you know like or it could be that in this particular case that the mom was abusive and he had to rescue the kids or maybe it was just a mistake of fact he thought it was his day to pick up the kids right so defenses exist two crimes then it's up to the trier of fact the jury to determine whether or not those defenses actually hold water and with those defenses and with that criminal um uh burden in mind beyond all reasonable doubt do the defenses now shift that balance where maybe when you the crimp you know the, the district attorney was talking you were like yeah that person is guilty yeah he did this stuff wrong yeah he did all this he shouldn't have done that then you hear the flip side and you're like oh well maybe there was a reason that this was done and so it's not he did not or she did not commit those crimes beyond all reasonable doubt when we also talk about crime i'm going to give you now a fact pattern I will go back to my purse. So somebody, you know, came into the classroom, took my very expensive Louis Vuitton bag and ran out. I have a permit to carry. I go out and I shoot them in the hallway. Am I allowed to do that? No. 
I like that emphatic no. <laughs> no, why not? Because that's just that's like uh, unreasonable. Wrong, so I'll make a right. Uh, that's an wrong, unreasonable. Yeah. Unreasonable what? Yeah, it's unreasonable. You cannot. This is a write it down moment. You cannot write it down. You cannot use force to protect property. You cannot use force to protect property. Is that why there are some cases where like people have broken into people's houses and then they get like the robber sues the person for yep, injury? Exactly, in exactly, exactly correct. Yeah, because you can that. Sorry, go ahead, Carmine. I remember hearing a case a while back about a dude in Texas who yep. saw his neighbor's house getting robbed. Yep, exactly. And, That's exactly. Usually I talk about that case. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and he went, he called 911 and he told the 911 dispatcher, I got a shotgun. I'm going to go shoot them. And the guy tried to talk him down and he still went out and he shot the guys. I think he got away with it though. No, he actually lost his house, his property. Oh. He was found guilty. So the robber ended up getting shot and they sued, the robber sued the homeowner and won. Oh, yeah. So, um, does that still apply in states that have stand your ground though? Or is that still only, I think it's different. I think in it. And if it's you, if you're shooting somebody that comes into your home, it's different. So there are some states that have different laws like that. So that that's actually great segue. Cause now I'm going to bring you, give you another example. Uh, let's say I'm home. My children are sleeping. Alexa just said, welcome home because she thinks I'm talking to her. <laughs> Somebody comes into my home. I hear the noises. I hear something going on. It looks like they are trying to rob. And I get up, I take a knife, and I stab them. Yeah, you can do that. Why? Because, because they broke yeah. your house. You don't know if they're going to try to hurt you. That's what you want to hang your hat on. My life... I was yeah. in fear of my life and in fear of my children's lives. But if they're fleeing your home and you try to do that, you can get in trouble. Exactly. So that that's great segue. Now I was going to flip it. If, because I didn't specify where I stabbed them, right? So let's say I stabbed the person in the back. Am I justified at that point? Wait, is the person still in your house? Yes, they're still my house. I he could be leaving now. Exactly, exactly. So stabbing somebody in the back, shooting somebody in the back is, could be, could hurt me as the homeowner. Why? Because that person could be leaving. They could be taking their steps back. So I could potentially get in trouble. I would have to, again, you know, argue saying that, well, maybe they were going, somebody just said it, maybe they were going to get a gun. Maybe they were, you know, they weren't leaving. They weren't heading towards the door. They were actually heading towards my kid's room, right? So many questions like yes. in this, you know, it's not like, it's not like a direct answer. There's so many what ifs, but. Absolutely. Like and that's the whole, that's the beauty of the law. That's what I think anyway. There are so many different fact patterns, different scenarios. You change one thing. You can change the layout of the house. You can have all these things. And that's why it's important as an attorney or somebody who's thinking about the law to ask as many questions as possible, to get as much information as possible, because the law is not black or white. It's so much gray. A ton, a ton of gray. And you know what else I didn't get into today? You know, depending on where you live, okay? Depending on, do you have, if you're going be, you know, in front of a jury of your peers, are your, if you're black and you're, the jury is white, are they going to go one way? If you're brown and the jury is all white, is it going to be one way? Or is it vice versa? If you live in a small town versus a big city, is it going to be one way? If you're a professional and the jury is all members of, you know, uh, hardworking blue collar people, are, is it going to have a different outcome? There are so many underlying factors and sometimes inherent prejudices, or sometimes people don't even think about um, these internal biases that exist, right? So it's not even just the fact pattern that's given to you, but it's also all these outside forces as well, okay? Any questions so far before I move on to, actually, this is the next and final thing, and then we'll be done for the night. 
All right, so I'm going to move on. So the next thing, also one of the other defenses um, that I want you to know, and this is actually something that carries through the semester, is duress. Sometimes duress, D-U-R-E-S-S, -S, is a defense. And what is duress? When somebody makes you do something. So I think one of you had mentioned robbing a bank. If you go and you rob a bank, and then you go out, and then you plea duress, that's a defense. What does that actually mean? Somebody made you do it. Maybe somebody kidnapped your child or said they were going to kill somebody you love if you didn't move forward with this plan because you actually worked in the bank or whatever. So you had to do this, rob a bank, to protect the life. So it wasn't something, you didn't have the mens rea. Remember we talked about mens rea? You didn't have that mental component to want to rob the bank. You went through with the action. You had no intention, basically. You had no intention to do it, but you had to do it because of um, outside circumstances. And you said it's duress, right? Duress. D duress. as in David, oh, U-R-E-S-S, -S. yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So D-U-R-E-S-S. -S. Correct. Oh, yeah. All right. So the next thing I want to know, and this is the final thing, we're going to talk about the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth amendment. And I think these are all really, really interesting they're not concepts. I mean, th these are the, the Fourth Amendment, right? Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. And you've heard of all this before. So when I, when I actually say, it, you're gonna be like, oh, I know this. The Fourth Amendment is a what? It protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And you need to know, by the way, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth. I always test on that. So you need to know. It could be straight up definitions, but you need to know Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment, what it does is it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. So I'm going to give you now a fact pattern. You tell me whether or not there's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. You live with a roommate. You have uh, in this apartment, you have your individual rooms, bedrooms, and then you have common areas. So you have a living room a kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, pol you live in a building. The police knock and they say that, um, you know, there was a burglary, a robbery in one of the other apartments. They just kind of want to come take a look around and make sure everything was okay with us. You say to the police, sure, come on in. They come in, they search the premises. Your roommate is not home and the door is closed. They ask you, oh, is it okay if we go in? Just to take a quick look around, you say, sure. When they enter that room, they find some of the items stolen, but they also find drugs. They collect that stuff. They arrest your friend. Was there a violation of any Fourth Amendment rights? Did they have a right to no. go in there? No, you gave them permission to enter. Whose name's on the lease? No, uh, I... It is. It is a violation. Could be. They weren't looking for drugs because, too, and they arrested her for drugs. They. It's in plain view. It was right on top of the a, counter. Plain it's view. a violation because you, uh, you live with someone else. They only asked one person if they can come inside and check. So if you live with a roommate, shouldn't they need that person's permission too? Yes. Well, that would did. be that would be now the argument that you're making. And so in the scenario I gave you, it is not a clear yes or no, because it's going to depend on the relationship between the roommates. Do they freely go into each other's rooms? When I said the door was, it wasn't locked, they went in. What if the door wasn't even closed? What if it was slightly ajar? Would it also be different if there was a sign on the door that had do not enter cross, you know, the skull and the crossbones or a lock on the outside and then they opened it? So a lot of times I'm going to ask you questions, fact patterns. It's to get you to think, but it's not a clear yes or no question because there are so many different variations. So if I represent the person whose room was entered into, I'm going to say, I've never given my roommate permission. And I'm, all those things that you brought up to question, those are the things I'd be bringing up. I wasn't home. They had no right to go in there. They never go into my room. Um, it wasn't, you know, somebody placed it there. I haven't been home for X amount of days. What if it was my, you know, his stuff and they put it in there? All these other scenarios can come into play. So again, whenever you have these you know, fact patterns, or I want you to start thinking also, do about- do they have a warrant? Like, do they have well, a warrant? Well, that's why, see, with a warrant, you need probable cause. 
but there was no need for a warrant here because they the police asked for permission and it was granted. If the person who answered the door said, no, do you have a warrant? Then they could have had to, they would have had to go back and get a warrant. Yeah, but, but if you give only, permission. It was only answered by one of one out of the two people that lived there. It wasn't answered by. Both right. People. But that's why I talked about a roommate situation. And it depends on the common areas. The common areas belong to both people. If the door was. Oh, it depends on the relationship between the people. That's why I like that. Those would be the arguments you would make, but it may not be enough. Depends on the fact pattern, right? So that's the fourth amendment. So the fourth amendment is searches and seizures, um, unreasonable. If they actually, you know, took evidence, but they should have had a warrant and they didn't have a warrant, then that evidence would have to be thrown out. It's called something called fruit from the poisonous tree. That's like just for FYI, you know, for your, you know, information stuff. Um, okay, fifth amendment. You've heard this before. Fifth Amendment. Have you ever heard people say, I plead the fifth? What does that mean, I plead the fifth? The right to not self-incriminate. That's right. It is the right to not self-incriminate. So if you are on trial, there are allegations being made against you, accusations, and you're on trial for murder, you don't actually have to go and testify. The Fifth Amendment gives you the right to not incriminate yourself. But again, let's talk about real life. If you are being charged with murder and there's like 12 people sitting in that jury box and you choose to exercise your right to not testify, what are the jurors going to think? You look soft. Yeah, they're guilty? Yeah, they, I think you're guilty. Bridget, what'd you say? They might said that they look soft. What? Like they look like, like they did it. Like they look like yeah. they did it. Were you using short for suspicious? People? Yeah, oh, suspicious. Yeah, yeah no, false. don't don't use um things like that because I'm not gonna know it, honey. Um, so yes, they're gonna think they're gonna have that assumption that this person is actually guilty, even though there is a right to not go out. And usually the defense attorney will say, My client doesn't have to prove their innocence, they are presumed innocent until the district attorney's office over there and proves so beyond all reasonable doubt every single element. But again, it's kind of like human nature, what's going to happen. Uh, so times, don't defense attorneys argue for their clients not to go up, even though like a lot of times they want to defend themselves, but you yeah. don't know they can get asked from. Yeah, yeah. You don't know. And also like there's, you know, different types of clients. Some of them are just they might say the wrong thing or they just like, even in civil cases, we've had cases where it's like, you tell your, you tell your clients don't get up there because you suck as a witness. You know, the other side is going to ask you questions. And now once you put yourself on the stand, you can be asked a whole bunch of things. Now there's rules of evidence and things like that, but. It's you easy might, to be made emotional too. And they want to get yeah. you emotional to get you. Yeah, exactly. 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 So those are the things you kind of just, um, you know, be careful. So that's, that's your, your fifth amendment, right? To self-incrimination. The sixth amendment, the last one is you, the most important aspect of it is the assistance of counsel. So the actual sixth amendment says it gives you a right to a speedy public trial. You have to be informed of the accusations. You could confront your witnesses, but the most important thing is you get the assistance of counsel. Now, if you are suing somebody in a car accident, do you get the assistance of counsel? You get free counsel for that? No. No, you don't. That's when your life is in you know, jeopardy of you losing your freedom. So the assistance of counsel is in criminal cases where you could potentially be imprisoned. Okay. Anybody have any questions about any of the material that we covered so far? Can you just repeat what you said for the Sixth Amendment? Sure. No. Right to counsel. That's the most important thing. Right to counsel. No, right like, to an attorney. Not the definition, like the example that you use. Just sure. To... So if you if you are in a civil case and you're suing somebody for like, you know, a car accident or slip and fall or anything like that, you don't get the right to counsel then. You have to go retain an attorney. Oh, but the if right... you're being accused of the crime. Yeah, if then... it's a criminal, if it's a criminal case. Okay. Yeah, because if you are accused of something negligence, and there's monetary um, damages, you're not going to get a free attorney at, at that point. It's when there are like life or death kind of thing, like where you could lose your potential freedom. Family court, there's some stuff also. Like that, you could go to prison. Or... Yeah, exactly. If you're going to go to prison. So for purposes of this class, if you're going to go to prison, 
if you're found guilty, you can get the assistance of counsel free. And that's only if someone accuses you of something. It's not, it's not somebody accuses you. It's, it's usually, it's always the state. So it's not, I mean, there's going to be victims, but it's the, um, the district attorney is the only entity that brings cases against you. Um, and then the victims testify. Okay. So it gives you the right to a speedy trial and assistance of counsel. Correct. Thank you. I saw some questions pop up. Let me just see here. Uh, fifth amendment. Yeah. Not right. To not self self-corporate. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to load this thing up. It's probably going to be tonight or tomorrow morning. I will put the lecture on Blackboard. So if there's anything that you missed, you'll be able to watch this again. You know, why not? Um, and so you'll be able to kind of, if there's anything you missed, you can watch it. And then next week, again, uh, log into Zoom and we'll, we'll have the same thing. Okay? Oh. All right. Good night, everyone. Wait, what, what was the word? I, I think I missed it. The what? Didn't we, weren't we supposed to have a word today or something? Well, today, I said that today I was going to just do the attendance. So if you weren't oh, here just for attendance, attendance okay. yeah, but next week we're going to start the secret phrases. Okay, secret phrases. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, Professor. Thank you, good Professor. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, good night. Professor. Thank you.